So, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the session on functional safety. Um, in, in this session, we'll be having three speakers and um, they'll be covering aspects about fault propagation, uh, verification flow, and, and uh, back to back simulations and everything that you'll be, you'll be interested in. Um, I'm very sure you're going to enjoy the session. And the first speaker is going to be Sergio. Uh, he's from he, uh, Watson and he's doing technical, he's a technical marketing manager there. And he has a lot of experience with constrained random simulation. Um, he was previously with Infineon Technologies. And um, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about faults. I think you heard a lot about faults already. But yeah, hopefully I'll add a little bit more on what has been said already. And in particular, we will look at the formal uh, fault propagation analysis that uh, uh, scales to you know, large, large problems. I will go quick on this introduction on the functional safety side, because I think you have heard in the tutorials and other presentation quite a lot already. But uh, the main ideas are that we have the uh, systematic and random failures, systematic failures typically traceable back to human errors, and uh, uh, random failures uh, due to physical events that uh, uh, occur in the field, like radiation, uh, problems due to wear out uh, of the circuit. And uh, risk drivers, we have a continuous increase you know, in complexity, uh, smaller geometries, uh, decreasing energy levels that all drives this risk up. And uh, we have uh, um, uh, risk management through functional safety standards. And in particular, we try to minimize systematic errors or avoid systematic errors and safeguard against random errors. Just a word on random errors. So random means uh, we don't know when they occur, so they occur unpredictably during uh, circuit operation. But of course, all our analysis is to predict something and we try to predict failure rates, right? So that's, that's the key point. <clears throat> and uh, landscape of functional safety standards, we have uh, loads. And a lot of what we say is actually applicable in uh, uh, not only on ISO 26262, the automotive one. <clears throat> so, what we do for uh, systematic faults, we basically have rigorous verification. As my boss says, uh, good verification on steroids. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 and requirement tracing and quantification of verification. On the uh, safeguarding against random faults, we introduce safety mechanisms and we need to verify them. And really, the verification is uh, two aspects. One aspect is making sure that the, the safety mechanism does what it's supposed to do. Uh, it does no bugs. And the other aspect is, uh, is it good enough? Does it catch enough faults? So having, you know, this diagnostic college metrics, which is uh, the focus of, of, this, uh, of this talk. And we will uh, uh, particularly look at the stack at zero, stack at one fault. Potentially, of course, you might be interested in at uh, other type of faults. But as uh, already uh, in the panel, this morning, I, I don't know if you follow the panel. Um, you know, someone said, you know, stack at one, stack at zero is already not so easy, and it gives you a lot of information. <clears throat> so, in ISO 26262, we have a, a clear way to classify faults. And uh, from a conceptual point of view, we want to distinguish between safe faults, faults that can cause no harm, so to speak, that do not propagate to observation point on our circuits, which could be, for example, the outputs. Uh, faults that are detected by the safety mechanism, so they might propagate, but they are detected by the safety mechanism, which can raise an alarm and either prevent a failure or control a failure. Um, and dangerous faults, which are the, the bad guys, and that they can propagate to, for example, to outputs and be missed by safety mechanisms. Now, uh, we will talk particularly about safe faults. And uh, <clears throat> of course, 
safe thoughts are good for you in the sense that they help you to achieve your diagnostic coverage. They help you to achieve your uh, targets to reach your ACIM qualification. But the, a fault is safe only after you, you know, you should prove that it's safe. If you don't prove that it's safe, and you have an, a fault that you are not sure about, so to speak, basically you need to go onto the safe side <laughs> and say, okay, this might be dangerous. And, uh, and unless basically you can prove uh, that a fault is safe, you must consider it as a residual, which is, let's say, in the bed category, in the bed bucket, the bucket that doesn't help you to reach a target. Now, why do we have safe faults in, in our design? There are a number of reasons, and uh, <clears throat> some safe faults are quite actually easy to figure out that they're safe. We can call them blowing in fruits. If you have uh, a signal that is logically tied to zero, and you consider a stuck at zero fault on this signal, it will not change the functionality. This is a clear, simple example of a fault that will not cause any harm. But uh, you may have more complicated uh, situation where it's not so easy to say this is a safe fault. And you know, also in a complex circuit, you're going to have lots of situations. You're going to have the logic that uh, might be inactive during normal operation, for example, debug logic or test logic. You may have logic that has performance impact in a way that does not, uh, has, is not so bad, so to speak, to prevent the circuit from performing. You may have truly redundant logic, which is, for example, due to synthesis deficiencies, some missed optimization from the synthesis tool. And you can have logic that is safely unrelated, so logic that is not involved in any uh, achievement, let's say, any uh, safety critical function. <clears throat> and typically, you're going to have, in a large uh, in the modern SOC, you're going to have lots of different safety mechanisms. Um, including software safety mechanisms. Uh, when lockstep, for example, on the course, redundancy, ECC parity for memory or bus transaction, and, and so on. Now, if we want to see the effectiveness of, uh, uh, we work at this level, the effectiveness of the uh, safety mechanism, it's quite hard. Uh, you have you know, many diverse safety mechanisms. You know, Maybe not all the logic is involved in safety uh, critical stuff, but uh, you are probably looking at a huge number of faults, even if you just go for stack and zero, stack and one model. <clears throat> Another bad news is that uh, you might have to do the analysis at, at the gate level. So typically ISO 262, we have seen also in the software uh, presentation on the firmware verification uh, in another presentation today, they always try to get you your results as close as possible to the physical device. Because of course these are more accurate results. So you might have to uh, uh, do an ice at the gate level, which is not as friendly as RTL. Um, of course, you, you know, fault simulation scales, and uh, people these days use fault simulator, but it's unlikely that you run you know, your environment and you easily reach your diagnostic coach target, especially if you are aiming for AC. C, S, and D. <clears throat> and what happens is that you might end up having to look, you know, how to improve things, look, look at coverage holes, which is in a sense a process similar to uh, what you do with coverage, uh, structural coverage, you know, effort intensive. So, formal can help, but we know, and we also said in the panel, you know, it's, it's uh, hard to scale at this kind of level, you know. So now, what I'm going to say, you know, give some ideas of how this analysis work and how you can uh, try to get your formal tool uh, to scale, to, 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 to make problems. So the, the analysis we want to make is basically we have some observation point. We want to check whether a fault can propagate to these observation points. And, uh, uh, you know, we want to fit to our analysis tool the RTL or the netlist fault list, which faults we want to consider, you know, otherwise the tool could take you know, all faults by default. And perhaps we want to have some input constraints, for example, switching off debug, test mode. And the first uh, question we want to uh, 
you know, as I said, you know, we want to focus this on safe faults. So one important interest information that we can get is safe faults, because what are the safe faults? If you can prove them, they help you to get your, your coverage up. So what we did is like, uh, okay, you know, of course you can, you can target the formal tweak to a specific problem. So normally, you know, uh, you can have tweaking of engines. But we thought, okay, let's really look a bit more at the root of this and have uh, two different, in a sense, two different, at least under the hood, almost two different tools tackling two different problems. So the first, uh, we called it fast analysis. So we call this first solution fast for population analysis. And the second, deep. So in the fast analysis, what we want to achieve basically is uh, I don't want the perfect results. Maybe I won't find each and every safe fault. I'm happy to kind of say, all right, I find 90% of the safe faults, but be quick and be able to handle my large design, possibly at the gate level. And so basically, uh, you know, you, you, of course, you can start targeting your formal engines to do this. You're going to deal with huge amount of faults, so you want to be careful with clustering. Um, another important thing is, uh, well, at this stage, if I'm only looking for safe faults, you can, for example, decide to drop your debug information. If the tool proves that the fault is safe, boom, and that it's safe. If the tool, for example, proves that it's not safe, you might want to debug that. But at this stage, you say, all right, don't bother about debug information. Cut it down to speed up. And uh, um, another important point is to drop the hard faults as soon as possible. Because if you spend a lot of time in, in a fault, uh, uh, then, you know, that is very hard. You are kind of eating uh, time for computational power that could go to the other faults. So because at this stage you are not really aiming to get 100% the safe faults, you need to be quick in dropping the hard one. It's crucial. And uh, the other thing is that really under the hood, because actually we call this an app, but uh, I think it's more than an app. Because under the hood, uh, you know, what the app does typically in, uh, in formal is, uh, for example, automatically generate assertions for you, whether it's for connectivity, for register checking, and then you use your engine to prove these automatically generated assertions. But here, actually, you, you can think about doing more than that and using, for example, color influence analysis, sequential equivalent checking under the hood, so also different techniques. The next step will be the deep analysis, where it's a different focus. Here, you want to be able to debug propagatable faults, so you need to keep uh, the debug information when you run proofs. And uh, you want to uh, uh, target smaller fault population, because theoretically, you, let's say, do the most of the analysis with uh, uh, fast, uh, fast analysis. And then maybe to go deeper into the analysis, you can use this other approach, these other settings, so to speak. And in this case, uh, you are assuming you will not just throw this at the thousand and thousand of faults, okay? And also, you might want to have more user input to do some refined analysis, for example, or hunting SVA constraints to know exactly under certain conditions if the fault can propagate or not. So the, the good news also with this approach is that uh, if you think about uh, integration with false simulation, it fits quite well. Because uh, on an initial fault population, you could run the fast analysis, you could find safe faults, and already, before you go to simulation, you don't need to bother with these faults anymore. They are done. <coughs> you run your fault simulation on your big design, and you probably, unless you're very lucky, uh, you're going to end up with uh, a bit green, green part uh, uh, of the pie quite large, some propagatable faults, but still you're left with some holes, right? With some faults that are still unclassified. And then you can run the dip on this smaller set of faults and hopefully find you know, some more stuff here with the formal again. So we see two different views of formal, and in a sense, under the hood, these are two different. You can think about two different tools because they are really targeting a very different problem. If you want, if you want the tool to scale, you really need to go a bit down in the roots, so to speak. 
and uh, in terms of the flow, you know, you start with fast, and you have let's say a kick, uh, you know jump start on reaching your target. You do your first simulation, and then instead of right away going to the manual analysis, which is very effort intensive, requires extra judgment, uh, you can run the deep FPA at this stage on a small set of codes. So just to give you some numbers on, uh, uh, just to give you an order of magnitude here of, you know, kind of the, the demonstration that this approach can work. This was run with the one spin tool uh, with the fault propagation analysis sub. And uh, uh, for the table, it doesn't show right, but the, uh, the numbers show. So we have an RTL design, which is an open core processor. We already have 12,000 faults, which is already not the trivial number. And we can do the fast analysis in two minutes and find quite a substantial number of faults that are safe. So first, uh, let me go to gate level first. So on gate level, you know, just to give you an indication of some design we've been running, and we have been up to two million faults, which is something you think can form a deal with two million faults. It sounds like a huge number, but it can. Of course, you jump in runtime, but you're still in the, in the range of hours. It's not like, you know, maybe overnight, or of course it depends also on the design, but uh, it's something that is uh, feasible to this uh, scale. And, uh, we have seen, you know, up to 14% say faults. <clears throat> and one thing I want you to notice now is that immediately, already with the first an uh, fast analysis, which is not perfect, so this is not finding all safe faults. But you can already see that you actually find a significant amount of safe faults. Much more than what you could find with the lying in fruits, so to speak. On the deep analysis, we can see already on the RTL example that we have uh, uh, 20 seconds per fault, so we already have order of magnitude slower, of course. And uh, uh, we uh, run, you know, on the residual, on the leftover fault, so to speak, and uh, we could see that uh, uh, you know runtimes of uh, minutes per fault. So again. You know, if you would run the fast analysis on two million faults with a runtime of two minutes per fault, it's not going to do it. But, uh, uh, you know, on the deep analysis, you want to look at, you know, few faults, very deep, and you can afford this. And you can still find more safe faults for a start, which is good news. You know, just to be uh, clear, this is 2.1% uh, of the remaining faults, not of the total faults. So. And uh, um, and also you are able here to do debug uh, with the deep analysis, which is you know I remind you in the fast analysis we said okay at this stage we can drop the debug information to make things faster. So when you do the uh, the debug, um, you typically would go to you know if you, you prove that well if you run deep FPA. If you prove that the fault is safe, you're done. Otherwise, you get a trace to debug, which shows you how the fault propagates. And you might have some missing constraints uh, that you might want to add. And you know, you, don't, you go through this flow. And uh, one thing, uh, um, I have the last slide coming up. Uh, one thing I, I want you to kind of think about is the debugging propagatable faults. It's actually not so easy. You know, the first time I debugged propagatable faults with, uh, without much tool support, so basically using the normal tool uh, with uh, you know, the, 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 the normal capabilities, it's a bit uh, tricky because if, in effect, you are looking at the design. For example, you do source, source code analysis, but actually the trace refers to a different design because it's not the, the good design, it's the faulty design. And in a sense, when you do this uh, uh, propagation analysis, it's good to like keep in mind both the good design <coughs> and the faulty design and see what's going on exactly. But of course, uh, you could run, for example, even in simulation, you could run two simulation, the good simulation and the faulty simulation. Maybe you may have, of course, in the tool, you might hope to have some smarter way to do that, so to speak, and uh, uh, have a better support for this. 
And actually, uh, what, uh, what I can show you here is a usual debug trace, but it does something peculiar. And uh, uh, let me show you. So this is actually on the net list level, this is a small FIFO. There is a stack at one fault inserted on the net. And uh, so you, you see this net is stuck at one, actually. But uh, uh, you see that part of this is white, here is red, and here is white again. And we see also a bunch of other signals being read in a specific cycle. And actually we see here that this fault propagates to the empty output here. So normally you have basically a, a write, write, read, read. You expect the file to be empty again, but the fault messes up and the empty flag doesn't go high, stays low. Now, the nice thing of this is that you're actually seeing two waveforms in once because the red tells you exactly where the good design differs from the faulty design. So here, even if you have a stack at one, it doesn't make a difference because the good design will still have logical value one. Here, the good design would have logical value zero, but the design with the stack as one. And similarly, for the other signals, you see how this propagates. So you see, for example, this signal is not affected up to here. This signal is only affected here. And, the, and you see exactly, basically, what the good and the bad design are doing, which is a, a nice way to, to see it. Otherwise, you would kind of have to keep in mind or uh, do some you know, double looking. And this is uh, very useful for debugging the designs with, with faults inserted, injected. And, and that's all. Do you have any questions? We have three minutes. Uh, when you find constraints of all the people in other space, would you then also go back to the first phase for, for detecting uh, in a more shallow way the safe faults and improving the results by the constraints? I guess it depends. If it's, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, big constraints that uh, is going to I mean, basically, the goal is, is if you're going to find a lot more safe faults, probably yes. If the constraint is such a constraint that you expect to find another 5,000 uh, faults, then you're probably better off putting this back in into the, uh, you know, especially if it's uh, an input constraint, you know, easy to express. You can, uh, you can uh, rerun potentially the fast analysis. Uh, if it only affects few faults, it might not be worth it. Yeah, I, it depends, I suppose. Yeah, so also for the fast mode, one of the things to scale up the analysis was to also give less uh, possibility for the user to do complicated constraining, which you have in the deep mode. But So it's a compromise, right? So you say, I want to run fast, I deep, drop debug information, I give less, uh, you know, uh, potential for the user to tweak every little thing and do every little thing. But you get, uh, you know, fast analysis on millions of faults, which is, uh, yeah, very, very useful. Was that on a time basis or some? How did you define what's fast? You can have options to define, uh, uh, you know, timeouts and things like that. So it depends on the design, of course. So in a sense, it's the user who defines what, what he, he or she wants. Typically, for a large design, you know, if you're looking at uh, hundreds of thousands of faults, you might be uh, willing to afford even an overnight run. I mean, you know, it's, it's very reasonable, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, of course, if you're on a small design, you can have minutes, uh, you know, or seconds even, depending on, and, and we, it's also useful on the small design. It doesn't mean it's also useful, it's only useful on huge design. And, uh, you know, on a small design, you can also run in, in uh, <coughs> seconds. How do you prove the tool is safe? <laughs> so, okay, how do I prove the tool? So, you mean maybe you refer to, to qualification issues in the standard? Um, so we are, uh, you want to take uh, your, this answer? Yeah, actually for this we would try uh, on the safety menu of cross-check. We propose to uh, have some, uh, do some sampling of all of the information compare against the simulator, because we've seen we have a simulator as well in this world. And then we 
again, sure that both agree on the, on the selection of faults to stop the insurer up to A's of B. But this is where we are going to get. Yeah, and uh, you know, by the way, I didn't want to make this, of course, you know, I work from one speed and I'm telling a lot about our tools, there is no shame on that. But I want also to make a little bit general, so give a sense that formal tool can scale if you if you go a bit down in the roots of it. And I'm sure our competitors, uh, you know, potentially they could achieve it too. So it's it's basically one of the points is uh, that yeah, formal tool can already do a bit maybe more than what you expect. Thank you.